Welcome to the GCN Tech Show. This week we've got world record attempts, Tour de France Tech, Bling Tech and a bike that was possibly ridden by the Peaky Blinders. And Ollie gets a step into the bike vault. How lucky is he? Lucky. Right then, what is hot in tech this week, Ollie? Tell me. AI has been used to develop an ultra aerodynamic bicycle. Oh gosh, <laughs> go on. So using uh, some new AI developed by some scientists in Switzerland, they're actually able to uh, optimize aerodynamically the shape of a bicycle by setting some predefined uh, parameters and then come up with an even more aerodynamic shape than would previously be possible. Okay, right. Right now, I've got quite a vivid imagination. I'm imagining a room filled with terminators welding together bike frames using lasers. Well, I cannot confirm or deny whether or not that is actually happening. <laughs> However, uh, the makers have actually used it to come up with a recumbent bicycle, which they hope will break the land speed record for human powered vehicles. It's an event being held in Nevada in September. Right, now I am excited by this because I absolutely love a record of any attempt, whether or not it's eating donuts or on a bicycle, I don't care. I absolutely love people pushing the limits. Uh, What's the current record though? Right, so the current record is quite frankly absolutely ridiculous. It's 133.78 kilometres an hour, <laughs> right? And it's, I, we just need to be clear about this. This is on the flat and completely unassisted. No drafting or anything, that is just human power. The AI does potentially have big implications though, because it has the power to offer a much more time and cost-effective way of aerodynamically optimising bike design rather than existing supercomputer methods, which are very, very costly. And it can also do it without human bias, which mm. is potentially very interesting as well. Yeah. Now, put simply, this means that the bikes that we ride could be made more aerodynamically efficient using this kind of tech. And the makers also believe that it could be used to, uh, to develop drones and uh, aeroplanes as well. All right, so basically Terminators. Well, uh, I quite like the idea of human bias though. Yeah. Yeah, well, it'll be interesting nonetheless, but assuming Judgment Day doesn't happen, then uh, the record attempt will be taking place in Nevada between the 10th and the 15th of September of this year. So stay tuned, because we'll be reporting on the results. Can't wait to see if they do it, and all the best of them. Yeah. Now, that isn't the only wacky cycling world record attempt though, that's going on right now, because there is an architect from Essex in the UK, Neil Campbell, who is attempting to break Fred Rompelberg's 1995 world record for essentially drafting behind a vehicle. Uh, now that record, like I say, it's been there since 1995, and there's quite a bit to be said about that. That's right, Campbell has already broken the British record held by speed demon Guy Martin, and then he took the European record, which was 217 kilometers an hour, just 217, <laughs> but the world record of Rompelberg, which he's gonna be attempting to break, is 268 kilometers per hour. But in order to do that, he's gonna be riding behind this. My word, this is called Red Victor. Uh, apparently it's the world's fastest street legal car. Get that? So it apparently it's got 3,000 brake horsepower. 3,000, it's a fair bit, isn't it? It's probably about 2,999 more than us combined. Um, and it's gonna be done on the Bonneville Salt Flats in Utah, where quite a lot of these world record attempts do actually take place. So it's less high tech than the previous record and more muscle car tech, I guess. Yeah, and what about the bike that he's gonna be riding? Yeah, and I don't know much about the bike. Um, we've seen photos of it and it looks pretty outrageous really, doesn't it? It's got a long old wheelbase. It's got kind of suspension for It looks kind of cross between, I don't know, cool motorbike, cool downhill mountain bike combined with a tandem and from a distance, it looks like it has a shopping basket on the front. But yeah, uh, yeah who are we to you know, criticise it or comment yeah. on it really? Because hopefully we will do a pro bike on this soon. That'd be so cool. Yeah. That'd, that'd be so cool. giving it a go? Yeah, it'd be wicked. What, that record attempt? No, no, just oh, right, a pro okay. bike video. Oh, it's gonna, it's gonna, <laughs> gonna try and draw you into something on air. How cool would that be? Anyway, more tech later. This week, we are asking the question, have disc brakes 
finally arrived in the pro peloton. In this year's Tour de France, many of the top riders are choosing to use disc brakes. Now this has got us thinking, will this moment be seen when we look back through history as the key moment when road bike disc brakes finally sort of took off? Yeah. Now, Ollie, you have well and truly just opened up the biggest can of worms, other than talking about one bite, that you could do on, on the GCN Tech Show. Um, now, it's a great topic. I absolutely love this because if we had this conversation probably only two years ago, I'm pretty sure we would both be in agreement, no, the pros will not be using disc brakes in the Tour de France ever, mm. or certainly not the top, top riders. Uh, and yeah. There are people out there who will say, it's the sponsors, they're putting pressures on the riders and the team to do it. Okay, there may be a degree of wanting their new products to be seen, you know, in the world's biggest race, but let's face it, those teams, they're going there to win stages, overall and such forth. And are they gonna risk forcing a rider to do something that they're not happy with? Because essentially, if the rider's not happy, they're not gonna get their full potential, are they? But is it full of advantages though, using disc brakes? Well, yeah, I think in the past you've seen domestiques uh, maybe being encouraged by the equipment brands to, to use uh, disc brakes. But here we have top riders like Peter Sagan. Yeah. And, and riders like that carry so much weight, they can choose to use whichever equipment they want. And, you know, they're advocating disc brakes. Yeah. Now, but yeah, I think you raise a good point that it's, it's not all plain sailing and there are some potential pitfalls and disadvantages to disc brakes. Mm. Now I think it's important to can remember or consider as well that disc brakes, you know, I mean they're not totally without fault, are they? Yeah, they're not perfect. I mean I've used them extensively and I, I think they're great, but there are a couple of little niggles. So firstly, the alignment, you have to get millimetre precision on the caliper and the rotor. And this can also be dependent on the torque of the through axle as well. So <laughs> Depending on the torque of the through axle, that can alter the alignment of the rotor and that can actually cause it to rub, which is really, really annoying. Yeah, that can be a real pain. Also, imagine this, a uh, team mechanic, heat of the moment, frantically trying to get down that spare bike for Sagan, gets it caught on another bike, rotor just gets a little bit of a bend in it, rubbing again. Yeah, and well, that's a, good, that's a really good point because with a caliper, like a rim brake bike, if you get a wheel change and your, your brakes rub in or the wheel gets knocked or something, you can just simply loosen the caliper, reach down on the fly or reach behind you and loosen it and stop it rubbing. So, you know, I guess you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't have to stop, but what, you know, you were, you've been at races this year. Do you yeah. think wheel changes are gonna be slower with disc brakes as well? Uh, I mean, that is a slight consideration, but I mean, I think in the heat of the moment, you know, the real punchy end of a race, a mechanic would probably give a spare bike rather than a spare wheel, even for a rim brake. But get this, I saw a mechanic at the Tour Down Under, he was hid away in the corner of his mechanic's little pen and he had a cordless drill, he had a torque setting on there and then he had a five millimeter hex bit and he was practicing putting in and out through axles onto a bike to see how fast he could do it in comparison. That's pretty cool. And it was like, vroom, vroom, but without the rubbish sound effects. It's I like that but, sound effects. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, a, it was a bit like Formula One style and I thought to myself, fair play to him, you know, he's seeing how quickly he can change it because I guess he doesn't want to be fumbling around with an Allen key or anything mm. like that at the side of the road. That's really cool. I mean, obviously wheel changes are only something that's of serious consideration to the pros, yeah. but the alignment and rubbing issues matter to all of us as well, I guess. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, if you're at the side of the road, you puncture yourself. Maybe you've only got a small multi-tool and you quite can't quite do up that through axle to the top, which you've set it up at home and then you've got that rubbing noise. But I mean, really, let's go back to the original point though. Is this the turning point for those disc brakes for pros? We want to know what the viewers think at home for this because essentially the viewers, I mean, we've kind of, you know, it's a split decision, isn't it? There's people who are absolutely lovers of rim brakes and then what, absolutely haters of rim brakes. Mm. So yeah, the pros, they have probably more say in this than what we do. Right, so last week, Emma and I, we put the question to you. How many of you out there have had a bike fit? And a whopping 68% of you said no, never had one. And that's a big number, isn't it? Yeah, I'm quite surprised by that. Yeah, I mean, we hear a lot about bike fitting. I thought more people would have had bike fits. Yeah. There we are. And we also asked how long it takes you to get used to a new bike. And 44% of you said one to two weeks. But quite surprisingly, really, 17% of you said immediately. I, I'm amazed. At that. I'm absolutely amazed at that. You can get on one straight away, can't yeah, you? Yeah, I can jump on a bike straight away, and it doesn't. I guess it doesn't really matter how I set it up. I'm going to be 
equally mediocre. Ignore that, bikes. he's better than that, all right? Uh, no, talk about that bike fit. Just before we came in to actually film, I was looking at the pro's Instagram profile, stalking them again, and I saw Seth Van Mark, he was actually thanking his mechanics for basically pandering to his needs of raising and lowering his saddle by one millimeter increments during stages of the Tour de France. That's a guy after my own heart. I absolutely love tinkering around with saddle position, probably when it's perfectly fine, but just for the peace of mind. Now, with one of the most talked about stages of this year's Tour de France being and gone, we thought we would have a look at some of the tech being used by the pros on stage nine of this year's race, also known as the Roubaix stage. Yeah, Team Sky were actually using their Pinarello Dogma K10s fitted with high ride suspension. So this is an electro hydraulic elastomer suspension unit that's uh, fitted between the seat stays and the seat tube. And what this does is it actually can offer what, uh, 11, 11 um, millimeters. Yeah, 11 millimeters of travel, and it's electronically controlled through a little clever unit. But uh, it can detect you know, changes in road surface and things, but it can also be controlled manually through the head unit as well. I think that's pretty cool. Uh, apparently that 11 mil of suspension, it doesn't sound like a lot. Uh, it reduces uh, vibration or road buzz by up to 30% compared to a standard frame. So, I mean, you know, it doesn't sound like a lot, but those marginal gains and Team Sky, they absolutely love those. Uh, as for the weight of the unit, the actual elastomer unit is 170 grams. Then you've got 130 grams for the battery, and then you've got a control unit of 20 grams. So it suddenly starts to ramp up a little bit. And get this, I don't know if the pros were using it or not, but they also make a spring system for your forks as well. That's gonna add 300 grams on. Uh, now I wasn't able to obviously go to the stage and take apart their bikes on the start line and have a good look around, but I'd be keen to find out if any of them did use that because those two paired up, you would be at quite a big advantage. Hmm. It wasn't all uh, special new bikes though. Primoz Roglic and his Lotto NL Yumbo squad were using old style Shimano Dura Ace derailleurs and old style C50 wheels. Um, he did have double wrapped bar tape though to take some of the sting out, which is quite a common modification. But it's worth factoring in that it requires a huge budget and a huge logistical effort in order to have completely dedicated separate bikes like Sky did for a stage like that because it means you have to have a whole nother truck full of spare bikes. Yeah, because there is so many different spares going to those races. Apparently, get this, Sky had about 50 volunteers roadside during that stage as well with spare wheels, bottles and all sorts wearing these fluorescent yellow t-shirts. Did you see them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. and they, yeah, they had the musettes as well. The yeah. Shiny. yeah. It's absolutely great though. Uh, now, riders as well, they were seen using these handmade artisan tubulars matured in cellars for years and years. Like you know, wine. <laughs> exactly. You know, you hear about these stories about people maturing tubulars, you're thinking you're crazy. But they're still doing it, and it surprises me because there are so many great tires available just off the market, aren't there? You know, it's not like maybe 10 or 15 years ago where the pros were using these secret components that we couldn't buy, we can. Um, now, I did also see on Instagram on the bike of one of the Wanty Group Go Bear riders from their mechanic, check this out. He must have, I, I hope the rider finished on that tubular because that is a hell of a story, isn't it? It looks like they've had a big old skid, they've survived. And get this, he didn't puncture that tubular tire. It's one of those continental uh, special edition Roubaix tubulars you can get. Yeah, like a double carcass. That is amazing. Yeah, that. I've kind of seen anything like it. Yeah, outrageous. Love Good it. Good advert. Yeah. <laughs> um, Pierre Roland uh, actually had a, her own sort of modification as well. Mm. He looked like he was actually going to in for a serious fight at Roubaix. He wrapped his knuckles like a bare knuckle boxer in some really funky tape. As well, which is pretty cool to try and take the sting out of the cobbles. Yeah, I'm not sure what I think of that. Um, I don't think personally I can carry off the fluorescent argyle uh, look, um, but I reckon you'd be all right. We'll wrap you up like oh. a mummy, send you on the cobbles. Thanks. <laughs> see how you get on, see how your joints are. Yeah. <laughs> see how your joints hold up. Need a bit more than that, I think, but yeah. <laughs> Now, sticking with clothing tech, as some people out there know, I like to get a magnifying glass out and look at the photos. And check this out, the jerseys being used by the BMC squad, some of them have got a two-way zipper. So this ASOS jersey, essentially you can open it from either the bottom or the top. But why would you want to do that? Well, I've thought of a couple of reasons. Uh, firstly, comfort break, a little bit quicker, I suppose, isn't it? You know, roadside, when you need to relieve yourself. Uh, the other one, 
is I think aerodynamics. So you're down on the hoods or on the drops, that kind of thing. And while you're in that tuck, um, if you have the jersey done, undone from the top, you're creating a bit of a windsock there, aren't you? Whereas if it's from the bottom, I guess it can escape a lot easier. So there we are, maybe there's some aerodynamics, or maybe it's just a different zip. Well, it's interesting that, because Team Emirates, uh, well Team UAE Emirates, were completely the other way with their clothing sponsor, Champion Systems. So rather than giving riders the option to unzip and cool themselves down, they've completely taken that away. <laughs> they have no zip. So you may have seen Dan Martin uh, win the stage at the Murder Britannia wearing this jersey with no zip on it. Uh, no, he wasn't wearing it backwards. It, it, it has no zip, so you can't cool yourself down at all. But apparently that's you know not needed. And this has been done to make the jersey more aerodynamic and presumably a little bit lighter as well. But it's yeah. interesting, isn't it? I mean, I'm amazed no one's worn what's basically a base layer with some pockets before in a race. Yeah. Um, I mean, we've seen people with skin suits with zips on the back, but like I said, it's just gone away totally. No zips. I wonder if they'll do a skin suit. Imagine him trying to get in that. Yeah. That would be awkward and embarrassing. Now, I'm not sure if you knew this or not, Ollie, but I love a good helmet. And well, Team Sky, they've been using the Cask Utopia this year at the Tour de France an awful lot. And as yet, it's actually unreleased, and I love to see a new helmet. Yeah, it's quite interesting because I've noticed that Team Sky has been really particular about which helmets it gets the riders to use depending on the stage and the weather. So on certain stages I've seen them use the much more vented models available from their sponsor cask, but also say for on the Roubaix stage they were all wearing the Utopia. Well, mm. I think Bernal was using the Protone, but the um, yeah, most team were wearing the Utopia. And, it does raise a really interesting question for me about the relative merits of the aerodynamic advantage, which is pretty easy to measure, versus the potential detrimental effect of overheating in an aero helmet and yeah, the sort of loss of minerals and what that would have, effect that would have. Yeah, I'm sure they would have done something, knowing Team Sky, to know that happy medium, you know, when they need the more vented helmets because those riders, I mean, some riders sweat an awful lot and some don't. Uh, I always want a helmet that breathes really, really well. I just tend to sweat a lot from my head. But yeah, there's got to be that happy medium, but where it is, who knows? You know, I know other teams in the past, they've looked at Team Sky, you know, the morning of the stage, and they've gone back in and changed, depending on what they're riding, you know. And it's there's a lot of mind games in pro cycling, isn't there? So who knows what it could be? I do know, though, that one helmet manufacturer were actually trying to integrate a sensor into their pads that could then feed back information to a head unit on a bicycle and let them know if they need to drink more electrolytes, more water, those kind of things. And let them know basically, like you say, the minerals and vitamins that they're losing when riding along. Wearable tech. Yeah, that mm. could be the future. Now, staying with sweat and vitamins and minerals, I guess, uh, I did notice on the bikes of Team Sky and Movistar in particular that they actually started the stages, or some of the early stages of this year's race, using 750 mil water bottles instead of 500 mil bottles. And you've got a theory why they're doing this, haven't you? Yeah, well, if you have a 750 bottle, it's gonna not really make much of a difference at the beginning of a flat stage uh, in terms of aerodynamics or weight. Um, yet it could have potentially big impact on the amount of energy that domestiques have to expend. So if they've got bigger bottles, presumably, they don't have to go back to the team car uh, as often. Um, and also that means they're saving energy in that regard, but also it means they can spend more time at the head of the race, protecting their team leader, and also staying out of trouble and hopefully avoiding crashes. So yeah, it seems pretty, pretty logical. It's a win-win situation really, yeah. isn't it? Now I want to end this with some bling tech. So check out this gold cassette on the bike of Annemiek van Vluten, who won the Giro Rosa, the women's 10-day stage race, which basically is their equivalent of the Giro d'Italia, isn't it? I absolutely love a bit of gold on a bike. Are you a gold chain kind of guy oh, or not? totally, yeah. Are you? Me and oh, Mr. T. Yes, <laughs> fist bump. Cy Richardson, he doesn't like gold chains, but I'm happy that you're All a gold, about chain the gold chain kind yeah. of guy. Yes, another one for the game. Anyway, more tech next week. On to the Wall of Fame. Now this week we have something really cool, but really old. So many of you will probably have seen the chainless driven system that we reported on last week from Ceramic Speed. 
Well, it turns out it's actually been done before. Who would have thought that? But over a hundred years ago, back in 1898, by the Quadrant Bicycle Company, and it was called the Chainless Roadster. Yeah, now this is really cool because we were actually alerted to this by many of you on social media, so thanks for that. Yeah, but thanks. we found an advert for this bike and it's got some really <laughs> cool details on it. So, the advert states that all the bearings in the Chainless Roadster are dustproof and oil retaining. Something which we would love on our bikes these days yeah, as well. <laughs> they were ahead of the curve. Uh, and it was also available in two different frame builds as well. So a strong build for heavier riders and also rougher surfaces. So presumably all those little boys delivering <laughs> loaves of hovis <laughs> at cobbled roads. And, uh, also a lighter weight build for smoother, better quality roads. Um, and John, it could have been yours for just 19 pounds, 10 shillings. It's probably about a million quid in today's money, isn't it? But wow, yeah. 19 pounds, 10 shillings, it sounds cheap. Uh, now, interestingly as well, this bike was made in Sheepcoach Street in Birmingham. So if you're from Sheepcoach Street in Birmingham, this bike was made in your road. How cool is that? It's pretty cool. Also, you'd imagine that probably the Peaky Blinders were riding these bikes as well. Peaky who? I oh, don't worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, leave your nominations for the Wall of Fame down there in the comments. And who knows, maybe we'll pick yours. Bike of the week now, and last week we put up the new specialised S-Works Venge from the Sagan collection against the Trek Madame Disc. Oh, this I reckon was a close battle. Go on, yeah. hit me with it. So, close, 56% was the winning margin, and wow. it went to the Specialised. Wow. Oh, there we are, and that is a close battle, isn't yeah. it? Two, I think, fantastic looking aero road bikes. Oh, well, nice. This week, then, how about this? I'm going to choose the Scott Foyle of Annemiek van Vluten, who's just won the Giro Rosa. That is a nice bike. Yeah, very nice bike. Up against the Pinarello K10 High Ride with that 11 millimeters of suspension. That one belonging to Luke Rowe of Team Sky. So, yeah, you know what to do. Vote up there. Next week, we'll reveal the results and have another battle of the bikes. Who are you going to choose? Scott. There we are, Scott. I'm going to go for the suspension because it's a little bit of tech. It's time for the Bike Vault, the part of the show where we rate your bicycle either nice or super nice. I've been looking forward to this. I bet he, well he has. He's not got his grubby little mitts <laughs> off of that belt since he set his eyes on it. Uh, but how do you get your bike in the bike vault? You submit it to the email address on the screen right now. Include obviously a picture of the bike, that does help, but also your name, where you come from, and some details about your beloved pride and joy. Let's crack on then. First up, Ian Munro. This is Ian's Pinarello, and he's from Cape Carteret in North Carolina in the USA. USA even. Yes. <laughs> Uh, what do you reckon of it? Yeah, it's nice. Well, I, I do like North Carolina as well, so I'm a bit biased. Oh, um, I, I, like I, the, I like the sunflowers. Sunflowers, yeah. they're just iconic with the month of July and cycling. Yeah, and I'm a big fan of the way he's colour coordinated the white bar tape, the white stem, and the white saddle. Yes. White bar tape is, is pro, and, and matching it with the saddle is. It's ultra pro. Basically, we give you permission at home to paint your bars and stems to match, and your handlebar <laughs> tape, with just emulsion or gloss. It yeah. does look cool. Uh, I mean, he's got big bottles on there, but that makes it's me feel- It's really hot though in North Carolina. Yeah, that's right. Ian, he's going out for an epic bicycle ride, isn't he? Yeah. I, mean, I think that's I, super I, nice, actually. Just, I quite yeah, like it. Yeah, it is super nice. Yeah. Go on. Ring that bell. Uh, right, next up. Right, who has put this in? If you snuck this one in, Jed Santos from the Philippines. This is Jed's Bianchi in the uh, lovely Celeste colour. Yeah, it's it's a nice bike, but it is. I, personally, I would have removed that saddlebag when I was taking the picture. Ah, yeah. I like the gun wall side, uh, sidewalls with the tyres. Yeah, and top it marks is. for wheel valve alignment as well. Oh yes, six o'clock position. Yeah, yeah. It's it, it's a nice bike. Um, but like you say, I think it's the saddlebag. Mm. It's just quite it's quite large, isn't it? Mm. Um, where do you prefer to put your spares? Pockets or saddlebag? Uh, a bottle, a bottle oh, compartment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is what I'd like to go for. Yeah, yeah, there we are. But yeah, yeah, nice, nice bike, nice one, Jed. Oh, uh, next up, this is John Kelly, and this is his Cannondale Cab Five. Um, it's at the Kessler Air Force Base in the USA. 
It's quite a statement, this bike. That's it's all the, I'm going to say about this. It's the most patriotic bike I think I've ever seen. Uh, yeah, I, I think Mario Cipollini would have been embarrassed to ride that in his heyday. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's America. It stands it's, out. Uh, yeah. It does stand out. <laughs> it's, uh, I love the way he's got American classic wheels as well, just to ram the message home yeah. as well. The, the old red, white and blue theme is fully there. I mean, we've got red hoods, red bar tape, red stem, a red front tyre, a blue rear tyre. And white wheels. I mean, it's diff. Full Even the bottle cages. White are... pedals as well. Yeah. I mean, top marks for colour coordination. Yeah. And also, I think it's pretty cool how it's got a one by system yeah, like uh, a, on there like as well. Yeah, one by hack going on. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, if we look as well, he's even got matching shoes, helmet, red, white, and blue, shoes, blue, probably some red on there as well. The saddle as well. Look at that. He's yeah. customised his physique saddle. Oh, well, that's well. That's red, a lot, white, and blue. A lot of thought gone into it. There is. I but mean, I'm, I'm torn between this because part of me. It's like fair play, that looks absolutely amazing. Then the other part is thinking, whoa, you should have just toned it down a little bit, John. Yes, yeah, I'm going to go nice. Yeah, I think I've got to go nice as well. It could have just been a little bit more subtle, John, but fair play to you. <laughs> you've gone out there and you've hunted high and low for those parts. Uh, next up, Stephen Anderson from Quebec. This is Stephen's specialised alley. Um, I mean, I, I think it's a nice looking bike. Yeah, well, it's a it? nice bike. Yeah. It's a nice looking bike. The background, it doesn't look, it looks very dry there, doesn't it? It looks like the depths of winter. Yeah, I'm not sure. Where is that? Quebec. Well, well Quebec, yeah. Um, one thing I must say, and it's, it has bugged me looking at it, is the bottle cage on the down tube. Can't quite see it, can you? It's in the yeah. black one. Yeah. I'd have matching bottle cages, personally. I'd get a Sharpie out and colour the silver one black. Isn't the hassle in there? <laughs> just painting it with a Sharpie. Or just yeah. spray paint it. Yeah, I think it's a nice bike. Yeah, nice bike, Stephen. Thank you very much. And finally, oh, the face says it all on Ollie. Uh, Timothy Churchill. This is at the Brands Hatch Race Circuit in Kent in the UK. Uh, used to have Formula One races there. I don't think they can anymore. The track isn't, or the runoff isn't big enough for yeah. uh, Formula One cars. Conago Concept Art Decor Blue. What about that? That is very tasty indeed. It's a big bike, isn't it? Yeah, I love the tan sidewalls as well. Always. Um, Always. Yeah. One little tiny negative though. Oh no. Uncut steerer. Ah, Any yes. And now Timothy Churchill, in his email, he did in fact mention that he just bought this bike, so he hasn't quite got his position dialed in. So that's probably a wise move, isn't it? After all, what's the yeah. motto? Well, measure twice, cut once. Exactly. He's been listening to my boring carpentry talk in the <laughs> office. Uh, so yeah, Timothy, fair play to you because you've not gone ahead and slammed it and well, got yourself potentially a bad back. Yeah, uh, yeah I think that. Oh, I mean, that's very tasty, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's got to be a super nice. You don't see many yeah. of those. Super nice. So that's it for the Bike Vault this week. Uh, a big thanks to Wally for ringing his bell um, and also, I mean, his debut appearance in here. Yeah, cool. I knew he wouldn't let us down. Uh, well, he nearly did. Uh, now, <laughs> do remember to send us in your pictures of your bikes using the email address. And we'll pick out some more, won't we? Yeah. We love them. Forward to we it. get so many, so please do be patient. They flood in. We think we're being spammed, but we're not. It's the love of you all. Right, we've reached the end of the show. Oh, yeah. Hate this moment. But what do we have coming up on the channel this week? Wow, good news. We've got Nairo Quintana's Pro Bike I got to look at at the Tour de France. Believe me, that bike is absolutely minuscule. I couldn't believe the size of the guy. Uh, but I wouldn't even say that's that a big, can he? Yeah, he's, he's pretty small. You can certainly climb well, can't you? So keep an eye out for that. Plus, we've got heaps more content coming from the Tour de France too, both here as well as on the main channel. So make sure you click that bell so you get notifications when we put up a new video. But before we go, Check out this, got a new tool. A little Topic oh. Mini 10 tool. It's got our logo on it. Yeah, look, he's cool as that. Put hands on that. Uh, yeah, 10 little bits of tools on there so you can adjust your bike on the go. If you're like me, stopping every 50 meters or so to play around with your saddle height. Or like Ollie, probably never use it because he's happy with any bike. Yeah. <laughs> can I keep this? Uh, yeah, go on then. Yes. Lost another one. Anyway, that's at <laughs> shop.globalcyclingnetwork.com. So head on over there to check it all out. And then for two more great videos, how about clicking down here for another pro bike and down here for some tech from the Eurobike show.